get ready. <laughs> For the next 10 minutes, I'm going to take you on an immersive reality journey into healthcare. Something that may look a little bit like this. But before we do that, imagine you've been up skiing, bridge or big sky, and you hurt your knee. You tore your ACL, now you have to go get surgery. Hmm, I'm bummed, okay? I have to go into surgery, I'm lying here. They're prepping me for surgery. These are some of the things that I'm thinking about. I'm wondering how painful this is gonna be. How long will it take for me to be myself? You know, I have some real anxiety about this. But hey, I'll be okay. They'll give me some anti-anxiety medications, some painkillers, those things known as narcotics. But what you didn't expect is that you may end up addicted to these things, these painkillers known as opioids. Okay, now look around. All of you are going into surgery tomorrow. They're probably going to triage Bozeman Hospital um, because that's a lot of people going in for surgery. But let's just imagine the numbers, let's say, let's take 100. There's way more of you in here all looking at me than 100, but let's imagine there's 100 of you. Of the 100, 29 of you will misuse those painkillers, those opioids. You never had anticipated on doing this. You misuse them. 12 of you will go on to develop an opioid use disorder. You have become addicted to these things. And sadly, one of you will develop a heroin addiction. Now, we're in the midst of a public health dilemma. Uh, you can see the graph up here. Overdose is now the leading cause of death. This is primarily due to this opioids. It used to be motor vehicle crashes between the ages of three and 30. Now it's a leading cause of death for those 50 years and younger. Okay, you had your surgery. You're good, you're thinking. The pain's over? Worse is over? No, I'm in pain. I need some painkillers. But what if I become one of those statistics? What if I become that person that misuses, becomes addicted? What if I transition to heroin? What can be done to help me? What if we can step outside the box and look at alternative means to painkillers? Not necessarily replace them, but what if there's an alternative adjunct therapy? What if we use virtual reality? For those of you who don't know what virtual reality is, they take you to a different world. They take you to a place, you know, anything you can imagine, it can take you there. We take people to beaches. We know that people like blue, they like water. Uh, we take them through forests. It's called attention restoration theory, science jargon for a really nice, soothing place. So here's one of our knee replacement patients. Let's imagine this is you, you're post-surgery. You're in the rehab area. And let's give you some doses of virtuality. What we're trying to study is how many doses of virtuality can we give you that will reduce the amount of opioids that you need? Or can we space them out? And or can we space them out? Okay, so now we're gonna go on this journey finally. The nurse gives you this headset and instructs you to begin exploring. And here's what you see. Okay, so next, you walk to this beach. There's a chair there. You sit in that chair, there's a pina colada on the side. Okay, remember your post-surgery. <laughs> and what we're doing is this exercise called a biofeedback e exercise. It's very effective in clinical settings for pain and anxiety. And I want you to walk along, pretend you're with me here. You're gonna see some text up on the screen, it'll say inhale, exhale. And what I want you to do is match, there's a sinusoidal graph, there's a big green line and then there's a red line. The red line would be what you would be, how you'd be breathing. You'd be wearing a respiration belt. There's a picture up here of uh, the PhD student, Courtney Linder, who helped develop this. 
uh, an MSU grad. And what it does is it measures the amount of respirations per minute. We know the resonance frequency is about five to six respirations per minute. You sitting here right now, your respiration minute, respirations per minute is about 20. So just take a moment and walk along as you see the exhale, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale. You keep doing this for about 15 minutes. We know that's about the optimal point to give you that relaxation, to help relieve the pain, help with anxiety. You begin exploring and you continue these respirations, five to six respirations per minute. So we're not the first to do this. Um, there was a professor at, in the 1990s, uh, Professor Hoffman, University of Washington, who used virtual reality for uh, burn victims. And what he did is he would place them in cold worlds. And it was found to be very efficacious for the pain. As you can imagine, this is a very painful, painful procedure um, during the bandage changes and the wound cleansing, cleansing. I've also thrown up a few studies up here to show you. These are peer-reviewed studies looking at the efficacy of VR in various settings, uh, burn, cancer. We're also working with uh, chemotherapy patients in Greenville, South Carolina, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Um, and then on the far right is our four clinical studies that we're doing right now, and we're showing real promise with VR in terms of pain reduction and anxiety. We're measuring perceived pain, but also physiological measures, heart rate, heart rate variability, electrodermal activity. And more recently, we're really excited, I love science, um, the brain. We're looking at how the brain is changing as a result of these VR experiences. Um, the actual pain receptors are less active during a VR experience than in a control condition. Okay, so before I leave you, what I want to show you is what we believe really is the next frontier. That was virtual reality. I believe, and I'm dedicating the next 10, 20 years of my life to this little headset. This is called mixed reality. And what this does is it allows you to see the real world in front of you. It understands the world in front of you, it understands the floor, the walls, the ceiling, the people in front of me. And what it can do is overlay digital content. So it's like, think about virtual reality, but it can overlay, create digital worlds, di digital items, people, things that you can actually touch and interact with. And how we're using this is we're creating holographic therapists. So I have an image up here of, uh, this is John. He's a persona of someone that he's a construction worker, he fell off a roof, hurt his back, prescribed these opioids, he's now become addicted to them, he has depression, and he's going and seeing a therapist, a cognitive behavioral therapist, and he finds that he needs a lot of help at night. So what we're trying to do is bring his therapist to his home when he has these depressive thoughts, these suicidal ideation, um, particularly at night. Um, and so what I'm going to do is show you a video. So just imagine that you're sitting in your living room, and we call this volumetric capture. It's a holographic version of her in his living room. I find it very helpful for us to talk about a particular situation when you felt depressed. So your family found out that you were using pills to relieve your pain. John, what was going through your mind when your family found out? John, how does it make you feel to hear that your family is disappointed? Okay, so there's actually several hospitals across Europe that are utilizing, that's, so that was mixed reality. Many are using virtual reality. Um, I threw up a few of the hospitals here, the Boston Children's Hospital, LA, Stanford, uh, also at Prisma Health, where we're doing our clinical studies. They're using VR for pain, anxiety. Um, I'd also like to thank the people that made this possible the students, the faculty, um, who really are the masterminds behind this work. Um, and finally, you know, stay tuned for your next immersive reality experience at a hospital, doctor's office, dentist's office near you. It's coming. Okay.